and a very warm welcome to Happy Times and Places, a positively inclined Doctor Who episode commentary podcast in which I, Toby Haydock, watch Doctor Who, drop in facts and information and observations, all the while trying to guess what my special guest's favourite thing about the episode might be. Hi there, Toby, and hi everyone. My name is Jess Jerkovic. I'm a jazz pianist, arranger, composer in New York City. And most recently, in the last four years, I've been doing a YouTube project called The Dudley Simpson Is Doctor Who Project, where I transcribe my favorite bits of Dudley Simpson music and create a solo piano arrangement of those pieces. I'm choosing Fury from the Deep. Well, hello, everybody. It's time for the final episode of Fury from the Deep. The bubble bath is uh, getting ever bubblier. Uh, The heartbeat is getting ever beatier. And the helicopter is about to get ever whirlier as we uh, say goodbye to the ever screamier Victoria Watling uh, in the final of these six entirely missing uh, episodes. Well, the episodes aren't entirely missing, but it's a story that is in, made it, that is entirely missing. But yes, as soon as you say the entirely missing episodes, you're opening yourself up to Doctor Who fans going, oh, I think we'll find the episodes themselves aren't entirely missing because there are bits of them. Uh, they'd be entirely correct. So I don't know why I've put on a stupid voice in order to in, in order to reduce their credibility. But that's because they know what I mean, uh, but would point it out anyway. Um, and by they, I mean uh, us. Anyway, let's not get into um, self-loathing <laughs> based on the behaviour of other people um, and sometimes my own. Uh, I've got a lot of fanish behaviour of my own to probably account for as I uh, talk about episode six of Fury from the Deep. That will have a final assessment from the estimable uh, p- uh, piano basher. I think I, I think there's probably a more elegant way of describing his great skill, Jess Jerkovic. Um, but before we uh, we uh, listen to him as he uh, lets Ebony and Ivory uh, plonk together in perfect harmony uh, with his uh, observations about Dudley Simpson and all sorts of other things, let's see if uh, the the sea and the weed. Uh, and if if there's harmony under the sea, uh, in the beach of Fury from the Deep, which I'm going to press play on episode six in three, two, one. I was desperately trying to find interesting words to say there. What a terrible introduction that was. Um, but there we go. Sometimes this is the non-scripted uh, Toby Haydoke's time travel so I spend a lot of time on the scripts for indefinable magic and um too much information so these ones they're they're ad-libbed and I'm afraid you you pays your money or you don't and you get the stumbling non-secretors and occasional mixed metaphors or occasional just very bad metaphors anyway uh Doctor Who and Jamie uh have uh, are having a foam party with Victor Madden, uh, that wonderful uh, skewiff jawed Cockney character actor, uh, who I think has been very good casting. Uh, and I remember Hugh David saying that Patrick Troughton had uh, taken him aside and said that Fury from the Deep was one of the best ones that uh, that he'd done. It's a good interview with Hugh David in that Doctor Who. Summer special with Patrick Mulcan. I think we used bits of it in the uh, in the documentary. Patrick very kindly uh, gave us access to the tapes. Gave us gave Chris. I've nothing to do with that uh, that documentary apart from you know being on hand to occasionally offer the odd thing. Um, but anyway, so uh, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a really good it's a it's a really good interview with you, David. I remember it really inspiring me and getting me very excited about. Uh, about the history of Doctor Who. Um, this is beautiful, this uh, this shot of sort of Robson with his uh, hands on his ears and the, th- the thrashing, uh, thrashing uh, seaweed. And, of course, the great gag that 
Victoria Watling, the great screamer of Doctor Who, uh, in a in a lovely little nod to the character, and that sort of flaw because she can be a bit shrill, bless her, Victoria. Um, is that actually her shrillness that could shatter glass? I've got French windows here. I'm not sure they're going to get get through the six episodes. Um, <coughs> uh, her her leather lungs come to the rescue, and and the high pitched sound. Uh, and now what we have in this house, we have a thing that you plug in uh, that emits a high pitched sound that is too high for humans to hear that uh, scares away mice because we had a bit of a, a mouse problem um uh that that uh, because we buy an alleyway and we're a bit warm and it gets cold outside and there's some scrubland behind us uh we, we had a, a a period where the mice decided to come and stay and one doesn't like to kill the mice so uh, i've got these things plugged in uh, and they emit a high-pitched beep to scare away to, to make the mice go don't like it here it's a bit too it's a bit too falsetto it's a bit too Bee Gees in this house uh, but apparently it also makes spiders go away as well which is a shame because spiders obviously uh, uh, although Shiz is very scared of spiders um, they should have spiders as a monster in Doctor Who one of these days now Hugh David I know uh, really liked this helicopter sequence and everyone that I've spoken to about the story uh, it's very well done in the recon by the way um uh, of course, their main memories, nobody really remembers being in the studio. Uh, everyone remembers being on location, particularly if you're staying in a hotel with a mad helicopter pilot called Mike Smith. Not that one or that one. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking Top of the Pops and then Remembrance of the Daleks. Um, uh, uh, and uh, they cheated, didn't they? They cheated doing uh, having a helicopter do a loop the loop, which is impossible, but... Uh, Hugh David made it happen with the magic of uh, filming and film editing. Although if it's anything like the seamless <laughs> uh, TARDIS descending from the sky and then and then and then landing on the sea, it's just a sort of crossfade. So, but it was those days where you could just make the suggestion that something had done something. Oh, it's done it in the. Uh, they've done it in the uh, in the recon. Well done. They've done the loop the loop, which I believe is impossible. But um, I. For, for, I think for viewers of the story, for, fa for for us as fans, because this this helicopter shenanigans has nothing to do with the story, but it's the, it's a good director going. Well, I've got this fantastic location. I've got a helicopter. In those days, if you had a helicopter, it was worth it was worth giving over an episode to. And it has to be said that 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 bit in uh, Fury from the Deep. Um, Oh, and we've got another. That now, that's not Mike Smith, the pilot. There's another. There's another pilot who does the talking. Keith, somebody, um, who, who talks them down and doesn't get a credit because he's not an actor. He's he's the other pilot, but uh, he actually gets quite a lot of lines. Um, but I suppose it was probably just sort of kind of ad libbed and well, they just cheated, doubtless. Um, uh, but yeah, in those days, you go well. I've got a helicopter. Helicopters are very expensive. Let's put it in the episode. I think these days you'd be a bit um yeah yeah um it's a helicopter okay we've seen helicopters on telly hollywood films have helicopters but and and of course we've had the helicopter in uh, in enemy of the world and the doctor doesn't he say i watched astrid fly it so they're even acknowledging yeah you know there's a lot of there's a lot of re repeated use of stuff isn't there helicopters phone machines uh you know if you've got something and it works well use it again i guess but um, but yeah, it was enough to go. A helicopter is a thing, so we can have a whacking great sequence with a helicopter that's kind of got nothing to do with the story. Uh, I was I liked it in the animation actually when uh, they they decided to have big fronds of giant seaweed sort of coming out of the sea to to augment the helicopter shenanigans with a bit of at least sort of plot related jeopardy. Whereas this is just um, you know trout and horsing about in a in a helicopter which i get i think is fine for the time but i I, su I suppose if one were saying and which episode of fury from the deep does one want to come back i'd probably go i i, I think i'd value I, i'd value some of the earlier sort of character stuff the even you know even an argument between three guys uh one of one of those arguments more than helicopter stuff but that's that might just be me um 
and of course with Hugh David being so proud of that material I, it might be a very pleasant surprise um, and, and he did tell somebody I think that he he thought he'd hung on to that film and I know that that you know Richard I think Bignall asked him to look for it and uh, uh, and maybe he did maybe he didn't and and I think because Hugh David's widow was Wendy Williams Vira from the Ark in Space I think they asked her to keep an eye out for it but she's no longer with us now and I know that her, her husband after Hugh David also was poorly after or around the time that Wendy Wendy died so um so if but but you know sometimes when people say oh I thought I'd hung on to a thing Peter Grigin thought a fan had given him a VHS of the Get Off My Cloud Out of the Unknown episode and we asked him to have a look but you know and you get all your hopes up and fans of course then go that must be true yeah well in the same way that Brian Hodgson said he'd recorded a uh, a, a commentary for Fury from the Deep at a convention uh, and he didn't he said I, I just recorded the 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 underwater one which was Underwater Menace, which we had literally just done. And somebody went, what, Fury from the Deep? And he went, oh, yeah, I think so. So then suddenly everyone's going, Fury from the Deep must have been found. Uh, and it's only when you've got a little bit of sort of inside knowledge of what's actually gone on that you see how ridiculous rumours fly. And, and of course, that to Brian Hodgson, the, the watery one, uh, you know, he, it's, it's not that important to him. That, that sort of detail is not going to come to him in the same way that, that we know the difference between every single story and take every sort of syllable that somebody utters as, as, a, as gospel truth. Um, and that and the, the difference between the various Doctor Who stories is perhaps more profound to us than by the people who worked on them at the time. Um, so anyway... So I've raised the spectre there of some potentially existing footage that may not have even existed in the first place. Or if it did, could have been chucked away decades and decades ago, even before we learnt that it might possibly have existed longer than the episode itself did. But anyway, because uh, Fury was one of the last to be trashed, I think, wasn't it, as well, typically. So it existed more recently than many of the other stories that have since come back. But whatever, there's no, there's no sort of poetic uh, injustice to it, is there? There's, there's episodes exist and episodes don't, and these ones don't. Um, uh, I like this, uh, this sort of, this, this reaching the climax of the story because, uh, you know, they, it feels like the sort of tendrils of the of the seaweed of sort of I like I like the way that the 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 the, the rigs are a sort of a, a sort of now a connected colony and that they've all been sort of infested along the pipelines by the weed I think that's that's a very compelling idea um uh and it's nice having a a a, a strong cool female senior character uh, Megan has kind of taken over really hasn't she although um Harris gets a bit of uh, gets gets a bit of uh, uh, lead in his pencil, if you like. Uh, well, perhaps he's ingested a bit of iron from the seaweed. Um, oh yes, and of course, uh, and of course she can't. Uh, Victoria cannot scream on cue. Of course she can't because uh, being asked to do something you do naturally. Uh, and I, I believe that that's a nice little that's and, and that's a nice little gag, isn't it? Because uh, actually she's she's not screaming because she's been told to. She's screaming because the uh, look at they, these are great shots, aren't they? The uh, the the weed and the foam are smashed through and and we've and we've got a little bit of. We've got a little bit of film, uh, some film trims found from Fury from the Deep that show us a little bit of what the foam and the monster and the filming was like. Uh, oh, and it's uh, tied in, isn't it, with Tony Cornell's um, cine footage as well. Um, so we've got a little bit of an approximation of what it might have looked like, which uh, is uh, delightful. You know, little pieces of the jigsaw being found behind the sofa and under the carpet and in a cupboard um he yeah he gets he gets a bit he gets a bit furious himself does harris and that's quite nice to see that you know he's he's got what it takes when he's needed uh <coughs> <coughs> but yes those were those were film trims weren't they and that the, they're silent film trims and they're not the takes that 
were used, they're the takes that weren't used. So they're just an approximation of what we uh, what we would have seen in the finished episode. But you know, we'll take anything in this day and age. Um, and yeah, that uh, that that foam bursting through looks like a really effective effective kind of sequence and peter day uh who is uh, uh the visual effects man who is a visual effects assistant on quatermass in the pit uh he's 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 now he's he's one of those rare people who has a who has a beard and no mustache he's a mustache shaver uh whilst keeping his beard the abraham lincoln look um are we going to get a bit more of the yeah um and I remember, yeah, Bill Bill Dudman, who's the cameraman on season twenty four, worked at Ealing when uh, w when this was on, and and, and talked about uh, the the doors being burst open. And I think they'd been, I think he said they'd been screwed on the wrong way, so they had to do it again. But yeah, look at that, the thrashing of the seaweed. I love that, and it brings to mind that uh, that picture in the the twentieth anniversary uh, Radio Times special of this sort of turning and swooshing, tall deep sea beer moth uh and uh, there's some quite good shots of the extras as well uh who seem to get a lot to do with their with their sound hair dryers um and i think there was an we tried to work it out there's an extra days filming they do an extra filming session for this um i don't know whether the, because they hadn't got enough done um now and here's here's a little bit of a sequence of uh of 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 price being terrified and i th and i think the doctor sort of moves him out of the way so it shows that that, that yeah that graham lehman's not uh, a, a wheelchair user within the drama uh and, uh and they've made him a wheelchair user in the uh in in the animation but uh but he his his movement was fairly restricted so i think that's a rare bit of movement for him um but as my partner sometimes tries to point out to people there is a there is a fair bit of ground between being confined to a wheelchair and being able to dance a jig. And uh, so you don't need to shout at her if you see her standing up out of her wheelchair and moving across to another seat. That's not because she's uh, a dull cheat. Uh, and I would say the same about uh, Graham Lehman, who, yes, have mobility issues, but, uh, uh, but, you know, could be moved from his seat, as we saw in that sequence. Um, loving this, loving the noise of the seaweed, loving the, the the thing bursting through, and and yeah, I believe in the plausibility of the um, the high pitched noise seeing off the seaweed because that ties in with the I know seaweed isn't a mouse or a spider, but I I buy it, I buy it, and all the sort of sonar and all of that business. So I buy that as a climax, and I think it's quite exciting. Um, even though everyone has the potential to look a bit comical if they've got soap suds in their hair. Um, but yeah, that's a nice that's a nice climax, and we've nice that we've got a little bit of it. Um, and as we will learn, uh, in seeing off the weed, everybody has survived. Um, a story with no deaths. The Savages is another one. You could say The Celestial Toymaker because you can sort of say, well, nobody in that is real. I think that's a slightly blurred one. Um, but yeah, there aren't there aren't many stories where nobody dies. And here's Robson and Maggie on the monitor. And they actually get to ask, what about Van Lutyens? I don't suppose he... Yes, he's out of shot, so we don't have to pay him to appear in the episode. But yes, even Van Lutyens is still with us. So that's the story ended with a good few minutes to go. And um, I mean, it's the sort of thing that, uh, you know, people might be quite cross about now if we spent a lot of time outside of the adventure. Uh, and it's unusual because, of course, if we were to do it now, you'd spend it with characters like Mickey and Jackie Tyler, who you're bound to see again. And so it sort of builds to the whole picture of the expanded universe that we need to tell Doctor Who stories these days. Um but we're never going to see Robson, Maggie, uh, and Frank, or and indeed even Victoria uh, again. Um, well, I suppose we see Victorian dimensions in time, don't we? Um, uh, and Robson is suddenly nice again, and you go, but hang on, hang on. he was he was an ass 
before he got taken over by the weed. Um, but I, I, it's odd because again, I, if this episode came back, I'd be like, oh, we get the scenes that are a bit less interesting. I don't watch Doctor Who for dinner parties, and yet I'm, I'm kind of charmed by the fact that they take their time to rehabilitate Robson back into the group and we see him go back to to work and have that nice bit with the chief engineer where he you know is a bit stroppy and the chief goes oh I see you're back to normal I think that's all very sweet and this this where you know maybe he's he's been served a bit of humble pie with his supper uh, because he was very unpleasant to Frank who he sees as a university graduate who shouldn't shouldn't have ideas um, with his soppy wife but we get but we get this nice yeah so this nice sort of coda um where we actually see life getting back to normal after the adventure whereas normally the doctor and i like actually that the doctor doesn't normally stick around because i i kind of i i read that as a kind of i'm a bit awkward with goodbyes and i don't i can't do the sort of ceremony stuff that people do and and goodbyes are weird and i you know goodbyes are terribly emotional things because you know the idea is that you know when it's like when i whenever you know one has finished a play you know you know at that last night party no matter how much you vow to keep in touch with everybody you know if you're in a cast of 11 the chances are you know four five six of them you will never see again as long as you live having just lived really intimately with them for the past few months and i find that a bit a, a bit a bit moving and a bit sad and you and you sort of can't really think about it and i sometimes lock myself in the loo and have a cry uh that's a very nice night shot of the of the complex um uh and and so i i buy the doctor's sort of thing of going i've got to go because i can't i you know in my head i know that as soon as i take off from these people they're essentially dead to me because i exist outside of time and space so they will have lived lived their life and you know if he if he now arrives 200 years in the future i mean everybody on the on the earth he lands on uh, well the wheel is but when he gets to the wheel in space everybody here is dead and that's quite a terrifying thing and actually as you know as you was one watches this although actually fury has done has done okay roy spencer is still with us uh june murphy brian cullingford um I mean, they were all still around in the in the 80s 90s when i was writing to people um but a lot of them didn't write back. Hello, Hubert Reese. I'd love to have got your autograph and a questionnaire back from you, Hubert Reese, because uh, he's lovely as Captain Ransom in the War Games and Stevenson in The Seeds of Doom. He's a terrific actor. Um, Victor Madden never comes back to Doctor Who again. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, so I, I, I do like the fact that the Doctor just goes, I can't face goodbyes, I'm off. But that means... That this is a, I'd swear you would give me lit. That's quite sweet. I, and I like, I like that this bit between the two men, which shows that they've got that sort of mutual respect thing going on. Even though you do have that niggling thing of going, but Robson is a bit of a perk. Um, but Victor Madden does well to sort of thaw him and warm him there and make it work. And 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 and, and the way that the chief interacts with him is 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 good and gives us allows us that moment. I think. Um, but this, yeah, this is an unusual story where instead of just scooting off into the darkness, the Doctor says, well, no, let's wait. <coughs> let's wait a bit. Um, you know, say goodbye to Frank and Maggie and, 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 and see, what's, see what's going on with Victoria. And you have this really sweet and totally believable stuff between her and Jamie that, that's built up. Uh, the story has afforded itself these little moments of quiet between the characters. And I think it... I don't think I'd want Doctor Who to do it all the time. I think it would it would slow Doctor Who down a little bit, maybe, and not make it the the zingy action adventure that we know and love it to be. But uh, seeing as stories of this time are sometimes slowed down by a little subplot of somebody being guarded in a corridor or, or just a chase scene or, or whatever, um, although this has also had the helicopter. So this has got the double whammy of the helicopter and Victoria. So there's, there's not much plot at all in this episode, if one is perfectly honest. But I trust the helicopter to have looked good, especially as Hugh David wanted to hang on to it, you know. Um, and uh, I think I, I think a, 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 a com 
you won't go without saying goodbye. I think that's so sweet. Um, and I think, you know, even that Victoria's only been around a year, but they've they've had a respect to the actress and the character. They've gone, well, no, we'll give you, we'll give you a moment. It's a it's a better ending than a lot of companions get, including this one, including Jamie. You know, who's uh, who's egress is quite perfunctory and this is necessarily so there's other stuff going on but there are many companions who i think would kill for an exit like this especially as there's another brilliant hugh david shot of people in the foreground and people in the background sweet little music uh and of course victoria is seen at the beginning of the next episode and indeed credited in the radio times and on screen in the next episode so actually victoria is not evil of the Daleks to Fury from the Deep. She's evil of the Daleks to the Wheel in Space uh, because her last story is actually the Wheel in Space uh, because Zoe does not appear till episode two. But that's a point of trivia. You won't find me um, dying on the hill of, but it is a fact that uh, we say she leaves in Fury from the Deep. She doesn't She doesn't so much, um, even though the shot of her in Fury from the Deep uh, in Wheel in Space is on film and is from the filming session of fury from the deep she didn't she wasn't she wasn't around for the recording of the wheel in space part one but whatevs there she is on the screen oh and she's staying without a change of clothes without any money i told you the harrises were a nice nice couple uh couldn't care less i really believe jamie's response and i think it's probably a bit of fraser fraser in that response as well uh although he did date debbie for a year after this they did. I think they did start seeing each other after she'd left. Uh, and what they've done on the recon is they've reversed. They've reversed the the shot because the, wasn't they? They did have the sort of model TARDIS, didn't they? Dangling from uh, dangling from the helicopter. Uh, make use of the helicopter that they had. Uh, so there we go. That is the end of a most unusual story. Uh, and I think they saw on the monitor. I think they used the helicopter to to pull away from to pull away from victoria so that you saw her receding into the distance uh and that is the end uh that is the end of fury from the deep um a story that i'm i've 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 struggled to sum up and i don't quite know why it's because of my very odd uh history with it the first story i knew the whole cast list for uh the one Ken Westbury, legend, worked on Kind Hearts and Coronets. I was very pleased we finally got him, only over the phone, but for the uh, for the for the commentary for this because he's a legend. He's in his nineties now. Uh, so there we go. Um, Fury from the Deep. Look at that. Well done to the reconstructors. Uh, they did a very very nice job on that. Uh, and isn't it nice that we have missing stories in animated and reconstructed form depending on what our particular desires are although I would and no offence to any of the skilled artisans behind both exchange all that for the episodes themselves but of course one would because uh, well you know I, I would love to see every single missing episode of Doctor Who they are a, like a big hole in my heart uh, and uh, a thing that causes me great sadness and a feeling of longing. But that, in a way, makes us feel alive. And that sense of loss keeps our interest and keeps our hunger and may perhaps work in, uh, 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 in favour of our continued love of Doctor Who, the fact that its history is not uh, entirely complete. But you know what? Um, I'm not going to say no to a little bit more completeness than we currently enjoy. So I've got to choose my favourite thing about episode six and a favourite overall bonus thing. Well, I think my favourite thing about episode six has to be the departure of Victoria, the way that they've uh, seeded it into the story so well. The fact that her screams uh, are the thing that... Uh, proved to be the key to the destruction of the beast uh, because I think that is a lovely uh, little way of using something that is particular to her something that she got a bit of a reputation for within the show something that historically we can look back on and sort of go gosh didn't ask scream a bit but actually they you know they were acutely aware of that and they they used that as a, a as a witty nod for her, her final sequence I think I actually can't think of a companion who gets a better send-off in terms of 
the amount of time invested into it within the story and the well how well played and well written it is you know I, it's it's the the, the relationship that, that is drawn between these three characters is really nicely and sensitively done and it and it's beautifully acted by them all as well it gives gives the characters space to breathe and the actors space to invest it with some some real sort of heartfelt emotion so i think you know victoria's departure the nature of it the build up to it the space that it is given uh, is is my favourite thing about episode six, and I think I think to make a wider point, I'm going to fall on my sword here, and I think for my bonus thing, I'm going to choose something Jess can't possibly choose, is that I'm going to choose what what fury is to me that I've, I've I've alluded to throughout this that I have this strange and I suppose every story. We, we we come across we have our are you uh, if we weren't you know if we weren't alive at the time we have our own unique set of circumstances as to how we came to it but fury is a really interesting one because there's no target novel when i was a kid so when i read about it it was just you know it was just the two praises that we had in doctor a celebration and the 20th anniversary radio time special but i still didn't quite get an angle on it that one picture that i had uh, was was actually turns out to be of the visual effects guy uh, with with a sort of thrashing seaweed over it and it made the seaweed look monster look like this sort of giant beer moth this massive wave whereas actually it's uh, it's it's no taller than a, a man it was just it's just the way that 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 has been caught that angle that that shot um and i didn't realize that was a special effect shot for years and years and then all of the other shots were basically Troughton and co on on the beach which don't really give you a flavor of the story so i never quite had an angle of the story i didn't know what any of the characters were called you know and it was victoria's leaving story that was the headline news and that her screams you know were the key to it so it was all centered around victoria really and the, and the story itself got kind of lost and then this book came out and it was this amazing book and suddenly um you know all the talk around it uh, gary russell's brilliant review of it which has a I can still quote from uh, suddenly conjures this idea of this story of being this amazing frightening thing it's like but hang on how come this is a story that no one really talks about apart from it being Victoria's missing story and then I wanted to know a bit more about it and then so of course I got that book and in fact I got given the book by one of the first sort of Doctor Who fans I probably probably met properly met a chap called Dan Jones who lived in uh, Wolverhampton who was a friend of a friend's brother uh, and I was sort of dropped off at his house and I met him and he lent me all his back copies of Doc 2 magazine and he'd got a spare copy of Fury from the Deep so he let me have it and he was the first sort of older fan that I'd ever met and and, and he was a proper fan you know and he dressed a bit like Doc 2 and uh, he had a little sort of bric-a-brac stall in uh, Will and Hall Market and uh, I still hear from Dan every now and again over the years we sort of reconnect but he's not very technical he doesn't do computers and things like that lovely lovely guy who was very indulgent of me as a rabbiting blooming youngster uh, and so suddenly I I then started to learn all about you know uh, or get access to old he lent me so many old doc two magazines which i've still got upstairs bless him uh but there he is um and yeah so i read fury from the deep and and, and was as amazing as uh as as i as, as that that review had said it was going to be and and i thought wow this is just and it's such a good target novel so then i started i started doing a fanzine and of course the first story i reviewed was fury from the deep i gave a brilliant review i'd never seen it i was reviewing it based on the book but of course i didn't want to let led on that i didn't actually know the story itself and then you know a bit later when i started collecting the soundtracks i got the cassette uh, which you can hardly hear and as i say it doesn't even give you the the the, the ending to episode two it, it doesn't the, the the theme doesn't kick in there the theme kicks in on a sort of repeat of that noise from the impeller it started again it, it's it's not been cut together quite properly uh, because whoever had done it originally had, had, had cut the closing titles off and whoever had done the version i'd got tried to put them back on they're in the wrong place but because it was so difficult to make out um you had to listen carefully to realize that you'd actually got a um you know you'd got a repeated bit um so so but then listening to it you know like like it's burbling itself from from beneath the sea uh gave it its own sort of atmosphere and i think i thought there was a lot more heartbeat in fury from the deep than there actually is because actually there was just all this interference on the soundtrack but again i'd I, 
huddled, listening, trying to discern what the story was like. And Victor Madden helped because he got that he's got that very distinctive sort of voice. Uh, and John Abenary helped because he got a slightly deeper voice. So you could you could you could sort of make out some of the actors, and it was but but straining to hear, not having it handed to you on a plate, meant again that that archaeology you were sort of you were you were sort of sweeping through the murky dust. This was arrow dust, you know, clogging your ears and, and making it not not quite discernible, but then encouraging other parts of your brain to sort of create imagery and imagine what it was like. And then a bit later, uh, the telesnaps turn up and then a few clips turn up. And, uh, you know, and gradually... So the, the story has come back to me, to me, uh, piece by piece by piece. So I've never quite been able to think about it as a whole i've i've only ever had it in sort of fragments and even watching it now you know continuously it's i i still don't quite know how it sort of coalesces together and yet it's this story that was my first ever proper favorite story it was the one that i like to say in company yeah fury from the deep's my favorite and that talks to a lot of the silly things that we do as fans or maybe just me but of of wanting to i'd wanted to be taken seriously as a fan or uh, or i wanted other fans to think oh god he, he must know his stuff if his favorite story is one that nobody's ever seen so that that speaks to ego and things like that and you have to look back at that and go what was i you know what that, 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 that you know how how silly was that um and and therefore one has to be forgiving now when one sees people saying daft things online themselves. You sort of go, well, I've done my plenty of my own daft things in the name of Doctor Who fandom and sometimes to try and make a stir or make people look at me in a certain way. I have to admit to that. I have to admit to that. I hope I'm beyond that now because I'm older and not wiser. I'm probably just less <laughs> less fun. <laughs> but whatever. It's a huge part of my Doctor Who experience, good and bad things that I've done that I look back on with great affection and go oh those were the days and things that I look back on and slightly cringe and go I reviewed a story for a fanzine that I never actually made uh, even though I'd never actually seen the story itself how dare I because I wanted to you know uh, <laughs> it's it's so it's a, it's a whole big part of my experience of being a Doctor Who fan of of discovering what there was in, in the vast history of Doctor Who and, and looking back on Doctor Who has been as important to to my Doctor Who experiences as looking forward and Fury from the Deep also because it was the, the first one that I learned the whole I didn't learn the whole cast list of I, I, I knew I could do the whole cast list of without thinking and that then became a thing I, I can do for every every certainly every classic Doctor Who story and I never sat down and sort of poured over them oh that's the other thing because yes after the book I got the Doctor Who program guide and so you know looked to see who some of the actors were and oh my god uh, you know John Abenary who was this guy that I'd already got a, an angle on he was Van Lutchens who was the character I was the most interested in because of what Gary Russell had said in his review and bloody bloody blah so it all you know all starts to sort of piece together um and uh and and so it's it has a unique place i suppose every story has a unique place in one's little personal mosaic of the doctor who experience but this one has a very special place in mind that means it is probably in execution and in actuality if it ever did turn up anywhere probably less than the sum of its parts of the various different stimuli it has to me i met graham lehman's son at a thing uh and uh he he, he was doing the show in the theater royal, in the theater royal bath when i was doing moth saint my doctor who scarf in the studio and the artistic director introduced us and said oh giles's dad was a well he said he was a time lord in doctor who in a patrick Troughton. So of course i reeled off the names of the time lords in the war machines in a moment of triumph and of course it was embarrassing because he wasn't any of those three people because he was a time lord in colony and space and the person had given quite the wrong pieces of information he went uh, no my dad was a guy called graham Lee. so i was able to go oh wow he's amazing but i'd already had my moment ruined because i'd been a show off or whatever anyway so you see it's mixed with triumph and embarrassment that's my whole that's my life with doctor who in a nutshell triumph and embarrassment uh hand in hand joined together um so fury from the deep is is the one it's that one it's that story it's that unique set of circumstances that that make it somehow more than just a doctor who serial and as i say i could probably do that with any but this this one i i think i could do it with particularly and 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 that just makes it uh 
a story that is that is special to me in a way that it can't be special probably to anybody else but you all all have your own story that's like that so so you know what whatever happens with doctor who i, I and and, and you know whether whether this ever comes back or we ever get bits of it or and and it turns out to be not very good at all i'll always have my journey and my experience with fury for the deep which made it such an exciting companion through my development as a young doctor who fan and for that i will always be very very grateful to it so i know jess won't have chosen that because his journey has been very different but isn't that the point so I fall on my sword there. Um, Victoria's departure for episode six and me, 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 me for the bonus. What has Jess chosen? Well, we made it through. Now I have to think of my favorite thing in episode six. I could choose, again, several things. The incredible scene of the weed breaking into the control room and swimming around in all that foam. There's a lovely dinner party with some rather tantalizing piano music in the background. There's the sense that Robson might even have become a better man at the end of this. But, well, what else could you really choose as my favorite thing? The way the departure of Victoria is handled, not just in this episode, but particularly in this episode, is my favorite thing. We're actually given premonitions of what's going to happen all the way back in episode three. Each of those successive episodes, three, four, and five, give us a scene where Victoria is able to express she's just not enjoying herself aboard the TARDIS. She loves the Doctor and Jamie, but she just is tired of being frightened all the time. And she gets to, she gets a buildup towards what eventually we, we know is coming in episode six. She even gets to be the method of the destruction of the weed, but she wants a quieter life. And what I like about this story is that almost a third of the story is given over to not only the sense of normality returning, uh, and the pleasantness of a social occasion. But we get to see how Victoria has become sad, but resigned to her choice to stay on Earth, albeit a hundred years or so ahead of when she was born. But she knows it's the right thing. and And it's lovely to see not only these scenes given to her departure, which is a relatively rare thing in the program's history. Uh, the crowning achievement in that is probably the departure of Joe Grant. Uh, but even the departure of someone like Sarah Jane Smith, despite it having a beautiful scene attached at the end, is just sort of a left turn thrown at us. Some companions don't even get that. We are given the buildup of her departure and then time is spent focusing on it. And I was speaking of character driven moments earlier. This whole segment is character driven because the threat is gone and now it's about real people with real effects. Classic Doctor Who isn't really known for this kind of emotional realism. And we got a little bit of that here at the end. And, you know, whether Victoria is your favorite companion or not, she got a great send off. Yay, Jess and I are of, uh, are as one, are in accord, uh, in harmony, uh, appropriate for a musician. Um, Jess has also recorded an outro, which I guess will have the bonus thing. I mean, I'm not going to win. I had some near misses with Fury, and I think it would have been quite appropriate had uh, had I guessed the right way a couple of times where I very nearly did I mean last week um, in fact my favorite scene I didn't choose and then and then just did choose that and, and uh, I was close a couple of other times so um, it would have been appropriate but do you know what I'm in a way my life has also been full of near misses and I've never been entirely satisfied so 
in a way, being happy with being close enough to success without actually achieving success is a nice mirror of my life uh, and my uh, and my connection with Doctor Who. And indeed, it is sort of Doctor Who itself. Doctor Who, um, I always, you know, I always feel with Doctor Who that it's never quite perfect and uh, I'd, it would never quite work. But that's that's my view of the world, you see. Um, and it never quite... You, you, you know, I, I did a whole thing in one of my shows that I cut out just at the end because I'd got too much material about how, you know, every Doctor Who story has a giant rat. You know, you can see a story where everything seems to be going so well. They've got the cast right, the production right, the script right, and then something comes in and ruins it, albeit a, whether it be a bad giant rat or a piece of bad CSO or a duff performance or whatever. It's very hard to get a perfect Doctor Who story. And and that's partially, but I, th- I, I think that's, it's it's learning to love life even though it has an element of disappointment learning to love doctor who even though there's always something in it that could spoil it for you if you wanted it to and going no i still love it despite its imperfections so in a way uh, i could have achieved perfection with fury and uh, uh, and and jess and actually uh, winning happy times and places for a rare moment with fury if i'd just chosen slightly more wisely or slightly more boldly or gone with my instincts on a couple of occasions but i'm sort of happy that i haven't because that is actually more appropriate um what is jess jess has a lovely energy and let's see what uh he says on his sort of coda Thanks so much, Toby, for letting me join you. This was a lot of fun, and uh, I hope my choices were neither too obvious nor too obscure. I like to feel like you will win occasionally. The Dudley Simpson is Doctor Who Project is on my YouTube channel. Uh, my username is Jester, two S's, Jester to Jazz. But search my name, Jess Jerkovic, and it's pretty easy to find me for that reason. As I say, over 40 pieces of music by Dudley Simpson, transcribed by ear and performed on piano. And if you're into it, I even analyze it and uh, rhapsodize about that too. There may even be another series. I may even do some more videos in the future. Right now, if anything, I'm considering and building more material for possibly more videos to come. Otherwise, uh, if you visit New York City and I happen to have a gig, you can hear me play. Thanks again. Well, can you imagine anything better than uh, somebody with Jess's lovely, open and cheerful energy playing the piano? There's something beautiful about watching a skilled uh, musician playing their instrument just with, just with, just lost in the ability and the enjoyment of it. I love that. And I'm not musical at all. I love watching people um, who can play with such skill just consumed in their own ability and enjoyment I, I i find it so compelling and lovely i i do love artistic endeavor um uh especially especially watching it being practiced by somebody you know who's so 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 very good so just didn't choose uh, a bonus that sometimes happens my instructions aren't uh, necessarily the clearest things and it's quite a big ask and actually it's appropriate that he didn't because mine was such an abstract choice he was never gonna uh, match with it anyway so so let my little bonus for fury from the deep exist in its own uh, little special compartment a bit like the dinner scene and the protracted departure of victoria and the chief robson chief engineer coda that are all very much uh, exist in their own little peninsula of uh, of the Doctor Who universe. Um, I've enjoyed Fury from the Deep. Um, it's nice to do a season five. Uh, I would like to do uh, uh, one of the season fives. We can actually see some moving footage for. I actually watched the Ice Warriors for fun uh, recently this weekend. Just gone as I record this because uh, I was in a kind of season five sort of mood. Um, I have someone who's promised to do the Ice Warriors and Tomb. Uh, and a few, yeah, I've, I think they've all been promised, um, apart from, I think, Abominable and Wheel, um, but nobody's recorded any yet, so you know who you are, 
well they, they probably don't listen that's why they they haven't recorded theirs because they've forgotten um but yes there are some others on the way somebody said they'll do web of fear but i can't remember who it is i've been looking at my spreadsheet and i've been going through my emails so uh it's appropriate it's it's, it's lost for now but uh, presumably somebody will turn up and and do it even if even 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 if it's a it's not a whole of somebody it's it's five sixths of somebody but maybe they've got an arm missing right um thank you for watching fury from the deep with me it is a very special story for me i'm so pleased we had a special guest like jess doing it uh, i was quite surprised that fury got chosen as late as it did it's one of the last stories to be taken really but um i've recorded it before uh, a lot of those that were chosen before it because i try and mix up the order uh, get different flavors of each era and uh, mix up the doctors and everything like that so there we go that's uh, troughton uh, what am i going to do next i'm going to do a tom baker next i think because this has been i've had to sort of gird my loins to do this because it is an ask doing a missing story especially as you know i've got to keep one eye on the action an ear on the dialogue and talk at the same time it's, it's slightly harder with the with the missing stories so i hope this has been okay for you and i i hope you haven't minded that it's been uh, uh that it's a journey that's taken on a few uh personal tangents but anyway let's uh let's all uh uh, go back under the sea uh, uh, and uh, try try to make life a bit less we, we could do with a bit less fury couldn't we calm seas i think we let's have some calm seas from now on uh, thanks very much for listening and until next time it's been a scream hang on i've just i've just found jesse's bonus uh, it was in a different folder. So here we go. Here's Jess's bonus thing. Okay, now for my bonus choice. Again, I had several things I could think of. I won't keep rhapsodizing about the music. I've always liked the pace of this story. I feel like it's a real slow burn, and then it is relentless for three or so episodes. I really like that slow build to a giant peak. One thing I like about season five in general is how much it teaches us that certain personalities shouldn't be in positions of power and yet somehow they get there. But what could we learn from 1968? No, what I choose is something that another doctor once was able to say with as much joy and glee as I think we all would, everybody lives. I remember the first time I listened to the audio way back, what, I guess that would be in the mid 2000s. And I found that so moving and almost cathartic that despite this incredible danger and the fear of it overwhelming the planet, it was parasitic and kept its hosts alive. And when it was killed, it just dropped off and left its human hosts dazed and bemused, but alive. And you don't get that very much. Doctor Who occasionally has some pretty high death counts. And this is one that, unless I've forgotten something, everybody lives and that is truly wonderful. Well, there we go. Good choice. Of course, everybody lives. I did talk about that. Um, I revel in death too much for that to be a good point for me. I think it's another thing that marks it up as sort of unusual rather than uh, rather special. No, it's it's no, it's a good choice. It's a good thing to choose, and it goes to show that you can tell what is renowned to be one of the most frightening Doctor Who stories of all time without any death. You know. Again, proof that, you know, fear uh, can be instilled without necessarily showing, you know, the, the, the most graphic or the worst uh, bits. But I think my main takeaway from that is that uh, uh, we thought the episode, you know, the episode was essentially, this episode of Happy Times and Places was essentially over. Uh, and then we had to, we, we tacked on quite an extended coda at the end just to finish up all the business. But that's because 
um, I'd yeah, the bonus was in a different folder, and I just assumed Jess had forgotten, but Jess had not forgotten. Uh, so um, uh, we uh, yeah, so apologies for that. Uh, but it yeah, it meant we uh, we had uh, a slow burn towards the end of the episode, and now I shall return to my usual grumpy, shouty workplace self, and we'll all be very happy about it. Goodbye. Well, thank you very much for listening to Happy Times and Places, which is presented by me, Toby Haydock, and my special guest this time around is Jess Jerkovic, who you can find on Twitter at Jess Jerkovic and online on YouTube at Dudley Simpson is Doctor Who. I'm grateful to Jess and to the many patrons who make these podcasts possible, and they include David Matthewman, Gareth McLean, James Lark, Guy Lambert, Clive Lewis, Ashley Knight, Christopher Joyce, Andrew Jordan, Richie Howarth, Dave Hoskin, Paul Gregory, Fraser Gregory, David Green, Lisa C. Greco, James Gould, Paul Goodridge, Gary Gillett, John Ellidge, Mark Dakin, John Curley, Andy Case, Paul Carrington, Paul Carnahan, Alex Capajoglu, Robin Bland, Gary Byrne, Rick Byatt, Will Brooks, David Bickley, James Bell, Kevin Ashelford, John Arnold, Pete Adamson and Luke Atkins. The music is by Dave Gates, artwork and Patterson. Would you like your name read out like that? Uh, well, if you would, it's a very simple thing to achieve. For as little as £3 a month, you can become a patron of Toby Haydock's Time Travels uh, by going to patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock. There are other higher tiers. Oh, they go all the way up to a million pounds. I, I don't think they do, but I'm, I'm. look, if we can make a way of that happening, if you want to. Uh, uh, but uh, even if you pay a million pounds a month, you still get a 10% discount if you sign up for a year. Patrons get advanced releases, bonus material, their very own podcast called Far Too Much Information, which is an offshoot of Too Much Information, which is one that everybody gets. But if you're a patron, you get it a month earlier. You also get Indefinable Magic a month to six weeks earlier. And these happy times and places, well, you're about six months ahead in Patronville. It is a monthly commitment, though, and I know times are tough. Uh, So if you just like to do a one-off contribution because you like a particular podcast or because I sound particularly needy and you, I have, I don't know, won the lottery or um, found a pound down the back of the sofa and wish to continue Vert it into metaphorical coffee, you can go to kofi.com forward slash Toby Haydoke. But yes, times are tough, and what costs you nothing is to give these podcasts five stars, a five star rating, and perhaps a couple of lines of review to entice other listeners really helps with the internet cyberspace algorithm that makes. Uh, podcasts noticeable which is especially needed if you are a Doctor Who related podcast because there are a lot out there and a lot of very good ones too Um, but if you think people should be listening to this one please uh, direct people towards it because that all helps tell Twitter tell Facebook uh, throw any positive opinions you may have around cyberspace and guide people towards Toby Haydoke's time travels Well, I'm going to be quick because uh, Fury from the Deep is only six episodes long, but during recording this Happy Times and Places, I think the UK has been through four Home Secretaries, no, four four Chancellors, only three Home Secretaries, and the Prime Minister's clung on, but by her fingernails, like John Abenary at the edge of the impeller shaft, although he eventually got sucked in and uh, died a foamy death. Well, he didn't die. Every Everybody lives. Not ever sure every prime minister necessarily survives this level of. Uh, well, put it like this: her, I suspect her heart is a beating, um, and not even the sonic screwdriver will get her out of this one. Uh, so, uh, if this means they're nothing to you, it's probably because, you know, yes, non-patrons. Six months is a long time in politics. So who knows where the UK will be when this is uh, put on general release? But patrons get it literally within days of recording so but even that's i mean that's a long time in politics these days so as i record this Liz trust is prime minister but there is no guarantee that that is still the case when this goes to patrons in about four or five days time uh so um well history will tell us what is what but uh goodness me uh, the times they are a changing <laughs> So that was
was Fury from the Deep. Uh, the only Doctor Who story written by Victor Pemberton, who has acted in Doctor Who in the Moonbase, script edited Doctor Who, Tomb of the Cybermen, written Doctor Who. Oh, and I didn't mention the Pescatons, which he wrote the, the, the record uh, where the monster is also defeated by a high-pitched noise. Although in this case, it's the Doctor playing the piccolo, which is a bit bizarre. Um, the Pescatons is a funny old thing, isn't it? Uh, but anyway, there we go. There was... And I was struggling for things to talk about sometimes, and now I've just thought of a load of things. Anyway, Victor Pemberton, he was a lovely fella. I met him a couple of times. Um, but look, that's this is we've nearly hit an hour, and Charity's coming inside from outside, and it's very late at night, and um, yes, the world is in turmoil. So, um, farewell.